In my video series about the coming demographic implosion, I explored long-term sub-replacement fertility rates around large swathes of the world as a cause of major political, economic and social crises in the not so distant future. Among the most severe negative impacts of this process will be shrinking tax bases, increasing amount of tax revenues being spent on pensions and care for the elderly, decreasing consumption, loss of national vitality and vigor connected mostly to young populations, decreasing economic, geopolitical and cultural importance of affected nations, and in the case of small nations, possibly also the question of national survival. The subject is increasingly brought up as a major concern by many high-profile people who perceive the looming crisis and the danger stemming from the massive population aging and inverted population pyramids as one of the most pressing issues of our time. More than just that, if the birth rates do not rise again above the replacement fertility level, it would mathematically lead to the extinction of the most affected nations and then potentially even the human race as a whole. Since the trend of declining birth rates is basically universal, Birth rates are expected to continue to decline even in high fertility regions like the Sub-Saharan Africa or the Middle East. But I consider this scenario unlikely and I firmly believe that fertility will rise again during this century in most of the worst affected regions such as East Asia or Southern and Eastern Europe. In this video I will explore why and how it will happen in my opinion. At the same time it is a fact that there is no state in the world where the birth rates did decrease firmly below the replacement level for more than a few years and where they have gone back up. They might oscillate around the two children per woman mark, but generally they stay low once they dip firmly below the replacement level. Governments thus do not have any real world example to follow and try to emulate when trying to implement socio-economic policies aimed at increasing the birth rates. No playbook to follow, as in the case of economic development, where different states can try to implement many different paths to higher prosperity, based on the success of various societies around the world. When it comes to the demographic decline, almost everybody is in the dark. Sure, there is significant variety in how acute the aging problem is for different societies. There are countries facing straight up population collapse of apocalyptic proportions, for example South Korea. And you have certain developed countries that can retain more or less stable population structures, although usually with significant immigration complementing their population for example France or the United States. Their experience will likely be that of slow and gradual aging, but aging it will be nonetheless. And there is no guarantee that birth rates won't drop permanently in such countries too. For example, in the United States, for a long time a beacon of higher fertility in contrast with Europe or Japan, the fertility rate did get under 1.7 children per woman in the last three years for the first time in recorded history. And in France, the number of live births went under 700,000 in 2022 for the first time since the World War II. But the experience will be most painful for the developing countries or emerging economies that did not yet manage to get as rich as the developed economies and are already getting close to a population dip and massive retirement. For example China, Poland or Thailand. At the same time, on the other hand, the earlier massive exposure to this profoundly painful societal process might give the affected countries certain advantage in the long run, since if the hypothesis that I will present in this video comes true, the very painful societal experience of nations experiencing massive aging will be one of the catalysts of the significant rise in fertility, an idea that I will come back to later in this video. But to determine if and why the fertility rates might rise significantly in the future, we have to first evaluate why they dipped down in the first place. When answering this question, we must distinguish between the local and the universal. Undeniably, there is a massive universal reason for the drop in birth rates. One, that cultural factors cannot explain. Iran, Chile, Thailand, Cuba, Belarus, Portugal, Switzerland, Canada, Turkey, Singapore, Finland or the Philippines. All the mentioned countries had sub-replacement fertility in the last couple of years. The sheer cultural, geographic and developmental variety of the named countries clearly points to universal forces being in play in synergy with the local ones. 
And even if we look at the fertility rates in the high growth regions, the trend is clear. They are going down. Sure, the demographic dynamics of the high growth regions with very young populations, large cohorts of people of reproductive age and still very high fertility rates mean that their population will grow explosively in the coming decades. Still, many countries with high population growth are just in the earlier phases of the same process. They are a couple of bus stops behind but are heading to the same end station eventually. To give some examples, the fertility rate of India went from 4 children per woman in 1990 to 2 children per woman in 2000. 21. The fertility rate of Vietnam follows an almost identical pattern, decreasing from 4 children per woman in 1990 to 2 children per woman in recent years. The fertility rate of Guatemala went from 3.8 children per woman in 2005 to 2.3 children per woman in 2021. The fertility rate of Iraq went from almost 6 children per woman in 1990 to 3.5 children per woman in 2021. And the fertility rate of Africa went from 6.6 .6 children per woman in 1980 to 4.3 children per woman in 2021. The decrease is thus universal and is caused mostly by the process of the demographic transition, which means that after the infant mortality rates have decreased rapidly, as they have done almost everywhere by now, people continue to have the same amount of children as they were used to in a time where sometimes half of the children did not survive to adulthood. But after a while, the amount of children per woman starts to decrease, since people get used to the vast majority of their children surviving, and they thus start to put more energy into the nurture of individual children instead of just having as many kids as possible to ensure the continuation of their genes somehow. This process is, of course, not fully conscious in the vast majority of cases, but it usually is accompanied by overall cultural changes connected to rising socio-economic development. The second most important factor is the rise in literacy rates among women, which usually predates the fall in fertility rates by a couple of years or decades. This is the broad overall arc that is truly more or less universal. Within this all-encompassing process, many local factors are connected to the specific cultural and economic environments of different societies. These include religiosity, socio-economic situation, levels of urbanization and such. So, while pretty much the whole of humanity is on the way to relatively very low levels of fertility by historical standards, they will not all be on the same level. That is why certain clusters of countries, for example the East Asian nations, are experiencing truly ultra-low fertility levels, around one child per woman. On the other hand, Northwestern Europe and the Anglosphere are, on average, hovering closer to two children per woman mark. The issue is complex and somewhat counterintuitive when we examine the mentioned developed nations. Many people tend to quickly blame the widespread feminism and the general female emancipation, but that hits the mark only partially. Sure, the fact that women are now educated, part of the workforce, much less dependent on men in regards to economic well-being and are in control of their reproductive rights via the contraception pill is crucial in causing the fertility rates to decrease from very high levels to levels between 1 to 2 children per woman, depending on a country. But within this relatively low fertility level, there is an opposite trend in play in which women in countries with a long tradition of female emancipation, for example Northwestern Europe and the Anglosphere, are more fertile than women in countries with more patriarchal traditions. This has been explored in depth by the French anthropologist Emmanuel Todt. He proposes that nations with a long history of female emancipation reaching as far back as the 17th century and defined, for example, by the time difference between the rise in literacy levels among men and women or the different position of women in different family systems are much better anthropologically equipped to handle the impacts of the sexual revolution happening from the 1960s on. The countries with the mentioned deep feminist tradition, what I will call anthropological feminism, are the countries of the Anglosphere, Ireland, Scandinavia, France, Netherlands or Belgium. The countries without anthropological feminist tradition include German-speaking Europe, Italy, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan or China. What it means in practice is that the countries with anthropological feminist tradition were able to, more or less, functionally integrate their family lives with the new wave of emancipation of women, which I will call modern feminism. Women are having children without it interrupting their work or academic careers severely, are coming back to work very soon after giving birth and maternity leave taken by fathers is more common. 
In such countries, there is usually a higher percentage of female college graduates than male college graduates, lower childlessness, and higher fertility rate. On the other hand, in countries without anthropological feminist historical tradition, modern feminism created a cultural dissonance in which it is very hard for women to pursue their careers and have children, since being a mother is still consciously or subconsciously perceived as a full-time job for a woman. Having children thus often means serious disruption to studying and working, and the women are more likely to choose one or the other. In such countries, men are higher percentage of college graduates, there are lower birth rates, and higher levels of childlessness among women. By this logic, if the spread of modern feminism, similar to the West, would, hypothetically, happen in very patriarchal societies, for example the one in Muslim countries, they would likely deal with very low fertility on the level of the East Asian nations. On the other hand, and I do not have this backed by any actual data, since it is hard to find any for continental Europe, so it is just my observation. I feel like the whole incel problem is not as severe in continental Europe, definitely not in my country of Czech Republic. In the Anglosphere in particular, it seems to be a grave concern. The fact that there are more female college graduates than male certainly fuels this process, since women usually date up in the social ladder. They are thus often less attracted to men on a lower educational level. I am in my late twenties and I do not see this being an issue around me. Most people in my social circle are in serious relationships. In the comments under my videos about these demographic issues, there always are enough comments with this sentiment. Quote, we just have to roll back all the rights given to Western women in the last 100 years and the birth rates will go back up. End of quote. But do you really think that is a viable option? Just think about it for a moment. You would strip away fundamental rights like the right to vote, study, work or own a bank account from half of the population of your country, including your mother or your sister. Female emancipation is like a genie out of the bottle. Once it happens, it cannot be undone. Not really. You cannot make women lose their aspirations and the desire to pursue various kinds of endeavors in life besides motherhood. You would end up in some handmade tale type of dystopian theocracy or gender-based apartheid of a kind. What kind of an impact on an economy would the withdrawal of half the workforce from the job market have? Disastrously disrupting the female emancipation, even if we can surely agree on the negative effects and profoundly cringe-inducing annoying character of its militant third-wave feminist incarnation, was, among other things, caused by the transformation of the labor market from physically heavy labor, in which men were naturally much more effective than women, to physically not very challenging types of work done mostly by our brains. The differences between men and women in these types of work are much less substantial. And even if it would be conceivable to roll back women's right to some pre-1960s level, it would eventually fail and the conservative cause would be terminally damaged by it. If you look at the examples of countries where some right-wing authority government held power and tried to impose conservative traditional values from above while the society was organically developing in a different direction, it then usually collapses and is afterward replaced by a society where the left is significantly empowered. Here we can name the Franco regime in Spain from the 1930s to the 1970s or the regime of the colonels in Greece in the 1960s. In both countries the left got eventually naturally boosted by the discreditation of conservatism by its connection with anti-democratic outright authoritarianism. And, on the other hand, the connection of the left with the fight for freedom against suppression. If some authoritarian right-wing regime imposes hard traditionalist conservatism on women to make them bear children, it would inevitably lead to martyrdom status for the oppressed women and any future attempts to implement conservative pro-family policies would be met with immediate accusations of trying to bring back the old authoritarian oppressive ways. Even if we look at contemporary Poland with its conservative traditionalist government, it is clear that such government with its electoral base consisting of elderly rural voters cannot persuade young women to have children. And even if you, hypothetically, somehow succeeded in rolling back women's rights and imposing a conservative, oppressive regime aimed at dramatically increasing fertility, it is just very hard to make women have children if they do not want to. It can be done, but the costs of such efforts are very high, financially, 
and especially socially. Here we can look at the example of Romania. Romanian communist totalitarian regime implemented hardcore pro-natalist policies from the 1960s on. A total ban on the import of contraceptives, very strict abortion laws, police presence in hospitals to prevent illegal abortions or the age of getting married lowered to 15 years. There was an immediate success, with the number of live births almost doubling year on year between 1966 and 1967 and the fertility rate shooting up from 1.9 children per woman to 3.6 children per woman. But from the 1967 peak it just kept decreasing, especially when the policing of the issue got laxer and there were huge negative externalities as, for example, the hundreds of thousands of unwanted kids growing up in orphanages in absolutely horrific conditions, sometimes without medical facilities and bathrooms, or severely abused by the staff. And again, Romania was a totalitarian dictatorship where you would not want to live and also on a completely different of socio-economic development back in the 1960s, incomparable with most western countries today. To implement such policies today, after the broad sexual liberation swept through the west, would be more painful by order of a magnitude. And you can hardly expect unwanted children to be properly raised by their parents to grow up outstanding and productive members of society. Family issues are delicate and armies of children without proper upbringing are not the solution. On the contrary, I am open about my conservative political leanings on this channel and one of the things that conservatives usually blame the progressive left for is the social engineering and utopianism in the form of pushing family, societal and economic models on the society to rebuild it to their image against the will and the interests of the people. This can be applied to mass immigration, detrimental and radical ecological policies or radical attempts at redefining the meaning of gender or traditional family models. But you cannot just reverse this and try to impose the opposite ideology on people against their will that is just as evil and, in effect, just as detrimental. Conservatism is largely about restraint, organic development and care in trying to preserve the values and institutions that proved functional and valuable in the past. Any meaningful, persistent and beneficial rise in fertility rates must come organically from the bottom up. Many governments throughout the western world are trying to increase the fertility of their countries, primarily by throwing money at the problem in one way or another. It can be in the literal cash transfers to families every month, as in the case of Poland's 500 plus program, extensive tax cuts and home loans, as in the case of Hungary, the expansion of childcare and the right to child allowances while working part-time in Germany and such. But generally, it can be concluded that the success of these policies is limited at best. In most countries, there was an uptick after the policies were introduced, raising the fertility rate from 1.3 children per woman to 1.45 children per woman in Poland, or from roughly 1.4 to 1.6 children per woman in Germany and Hungary. While every increase is valuable, those are mostly cosmetic changes that won't essentially change the course of the demographic development, and there are signs that the fertility rate has already peaked and is again declining, as in the case of Poland, or stagnant at best, as in the case of Hungary. In the debates under my videos, there are comments from people from almost all European countries dealing with low birth rates and putting the blame on the high prices of homes and the overall economic climate. Still, the truth is that it is not an explanation that holds under scrutiny. Most Western countries deal with high home prices and the differences between their fertility remains significant. There is no meaning overlap when you compare the home prices to income ratio and the fertility rate next to each other. Israel and the United States are among the countries with the highest home prices to income ratios in the world, especially Israel. And both countries have much less robust welfare states aimed at supporting the fertility rate in comparison with country like Germany. But they both had much higher fertility, which reached 2.2 children per woman even for the Israeli secular Jewish population. When people say that young people today cannot afford to have children, what it really means is that they cannot afford to have children while maintaining their consumption levels and aspirations, which are cultural more than economic. The economic situation influences fertility rates, but it is not at the heart of it, in my opinion. Sure, the financial crisis of 1929 seriously negatively impacted birth rates in Germany, but remember that people were starving back then. We are nowhere near such levels in contemporary Europe. 
To illustrate that, we can look at the higher fertility of practicing religious people in Europe who can have children while not being wealthier than the atheist population. At its core, it is a question of priorities and choices. I am not saying this in a judgmental manner, just describing the situation as I see it. The root cause is thus cultural first and foremost, and the culture is then intertwined with the local economy. In my opinion, there are three crucial factors. The fact that in the modern urbanized states without large agricultural sectors, people do not have much use for children in the purely economic sense of the word, since children won't help you with your weekly report in your corporate office job, as they would when you need to work on the harvest in the fields. Second, there are still functioning pension systems in most of the more affluent European countries, which means that most people still mentally operate in a world where they will be taken care of, at least to a certain extent, by the state in their old age. And third, the contemporary culture is selling to young people, and especially women, that they have the time to experience long years of youthful party life with cheap travel, music festivals and whatnot, full-fledged self-realization through career and having a family. But you have to make choices in life. It is tough to get all the mentioned things, and there is increasing evidence that many women remain childless unwantedly, since they count on having family in their 30s, but something unexpected happens. Maybe their relationship breaks up or there are some unforeseen work issues and they suddenly find out that they miss their fertility window and remain childless. Here the pension systems come into play. As I said earlier, most contemporary Europeans mentally function in a reality where people too old to work live largely on state distributed pensions. Those pensions are generally not paid by the cash the retirees have paid during their lives to the pension system, but by the contemporary people of working age. While in some of the more developed countries, private pension funds play a significant role in co-financing the pensions, many retirees are completely dependent on the state with their living standards, especially in post-communist Europe. This system will collapse in the future because of the demographic development that is increasingly being brought up in the public debate and the younger generations are trying to prepare for it. Still, very few people actually think about the consequences of this process in its entirety. When you look at the population projections of European countries to 2060, and such projections will very likely not be that far from reality. The amount of working age people to one retiree will be two workers per one retiree in basically all European countries. In 2010, it was four or five to one in the majority of Europe with few exceptions, namely Greece, Germany and Italy, already having the 3 to 1 ratio in 2010. And, on the opposite end of the spectrum, it was 5 or 6 to 1 in most of the post-communist countries, which have their population bulge usually in their 40s today and will thus experience the most massive decline 20 years from now. The most extreme projections are for Latvia, which is expected to have one retiree per one worker. And, on the other hand, Ireland will still have 3 to 1 ratio in 2060. And even today, living off a state pension in post-communist European countries is not not easy. A lot of the pensioners are poverty stricken. So you might ask, if my German grandmother receives a monthly pension of circa 1400 euros, the average pension for women in Germany, I will receive one third less when I retire in 2060, so less than 1000 euros. Or if my grandmother in Slovakia receives 580 euros, the average pension in Slovakia, I will receive one third of it in 2060, so less than 200 euros. You cannot live off that. Well, it is even worse. The massive aging won't just bring proportional lowering of the pensions according to the old age dependency ratio. It will have significant detrimental impacts on the economy as a whole. Domestic consumption, one of the crucial elements of GDP, will plummet, since there will be fewer young people consuming and those that will, will be severely tax burdened, which will lower their disposable incomes. The fact that it will be happening in most of the developed world simultaneously means that even export driven growth will be severely impacted. because consumption will plummet in many markets simultaneously. Pensions will eat a larger and larger share of the revenues which will not be invested in education, research and development or infrastructural investment which could generate some new economic development. And it will not be just pension costs that will skyrocket. It will also be healthcare costs, since elderly people are by far the largest recipients of healthcare services, or the social care in elderly homes and such. There is a perennial lack of workers in those segments even today. How will it look when there are double the number of retirees and half of the working age people? 
it is going to be genuinely horrific. The richest northwestern European countries like the Netherlands or Scandinavian countries will likely be able to weather the storm more smoothly. Still, southern and eastern Europe will suffer immensely, since they are significantly poorer and, in the case of southern Europe, also burdened by very high public debt. That also applies to all of East Asia, especially China, Taiwan or South Korea. In the discourse about this phenomenon in my country, the debate is usually centered around preparing for this by investing from young age to amass sufficient amounts of money for retirement. But let's face the music. Most people won't be able to save enough money to live off for 20 years of elderly life. That was possible for many western baby boomers since they experienced several decades of productive lives in booming post-war economic environment. But if you are 25 years old Lithuanian or Greek, it is not very likely to be able to experience the same golden age of capitalism as Westerners after the World War II. Sure, there likely will be changes in the retirement age and older people will be incentivized to work, at least partially, even after reaching the contemporary retirement age. But these changes won't cut it. The demographic decline is too severe. These economic troubles caused by the demographic downturns will also likely be multiplied by the migration of certain numbers of already low working age populations to the more prosperous parts of the world. So the schism between the countries with different demographic situations will only deepen. The projections could theoretically be wrong, but that would require an immediate massive rise in fertility rates across the affected countries. And I am not talking about a rise from 1.5 children per woman to 1.8. That is not enough. It would require an immediate perpetuated increase to levels above at least two children per woman. The thing is that the number of women of childbearing age in most of the worst affected countries is already too low. In post-communist Europe, the women born in the demographic contraction after the fall of communism in the 1990s are now becoming the majority of childbearing age women. In southern Europe, the current generation of women of childbearing age was already born to women with ultra-low fertility. And in East Asia, the fertility levels are often under one child per woman. I saw calculations saying that if the fertility fertility rate in Hungary would shoot up to 2.1 children per woman and stay there, the Hungarian population would continue to decline until it would stabilize at around 8.5 million people, since there are not enough women of childbearing age. The damage is already done and, in the short run, irreversible. When you read about the massive economic crisis in Greece after 2009 or talk with Greeks about it, basically everyone agrees that the Greek society could weather the storm somehow by falling back on the dense Greek family structures. Young people moved back to their villages and young families moved with their grandparents and pooled their resources to survive the dramatic economic downturn. I think there lies the key to the future increase in birth rates. Southern. Eastern European and East Asian societies will likely react similarly, since these cultures are deeply family oriented. At that point, it will be clearly visible that people that had kids, the more the better, will inevitably be better off than the people that remained childless or had only one child. It is just simple logic. My mother is one of three siblings. Now, when their mother, my grandmother, is over 90 years old and needs daily care, they share the burden. Financially, and in regard to time and energy spent. If my mother were an only child, taking care of my grandmother would be much more draining. If my grandmother had no children, she would live in a state-funded old folk home, usually not where you want to spend the autumn of your life, and nobody would ever come to visit. When the state-funded pensions collapse, and there is a general outbreak of crushing elderly poverty, young people will inevitably see that while the plight of the childless people is deeply sad, disturbing and gloomy, the people with kids are at least able to spend their final years surrounded by their families, even if not in prosperity. That will be, in my opinion, the crucial shift in the perception of having children. Today, people are having children mostly for emotional reasons. Some people are just very family oriented and always wanted to have kids. Some might even see it as a contribution to their nation and society. Even in the contemporary atmosphere of widespread culture normalization of childlessness, often supported by the liberal media as a sign of female emancipation, people still perceive having kids as a natural part of a fulfilled life. But they are a clear economic obstacle, a net financial loss. If you do not have enough money to have them, 
you ideally postpone it until you do. To have a lot of them is either a privilege of the rich or, on the other hand, connected to the poor people or ethnic minorities living on benefits, at least in the perception of the majority society. But almost no one perceives children as the oldest form of retirement insurance, which they always wear and I believe that they will be again. But people need to see it with their own eyes, which they won't until the crash happens and the illusion of state-funded pensions won't wither away. People in their 20s will be those entering retirement age after the pension collapse in the middle of the century. We should be having the kids right now, but almost nobody will, of course, which is understandable. When I discuss these demographic issues with people my age, they usually agree that it is fucked, but it won't affect their decision making regarding having children, which is logical. People need to experience the elderly poverty and loneliness firsthand to let it alter their behavior. At this point, it is just too abstract, something in the misty fog of future decades that is pointless to think about now when you are still young and full of energy. When talking with people my age that claim they do not want to have children, I always marvel at how it seems from their reasoning that life ends at 35 or maybe at 50 in their imagination. They do not want to have kids since they are a burden, you cannot travel they cost money and eat up your time. Sure, I completely understand that many people do not share my convictions about having children, which are also connected to patriotism and the deep urge to ensure the continuation of my family line. Many people do not care about these things at all. Fair enough, we are all different. But your life won't end at 35. If it will, that means you will die young and you do not want that. What are you going to do with the second half of your life? In your 50s, 60s, 70s or even 80s? What will fill your life with some meaning as the inevitable death come closer every day and you watch most of your friends being preoccupied with watching their children grow up and looking forward to having grandchildren? And to add to this increasing gloominess, you won't receive any pension. Bummer. I have always thought about this and found the vision of lonely childless second half of your life deeply depressing. Can you imagine the life of your grandparents if they never had a kid? There is nobody to visit them and frankly nobody to care about them. When you are an old person with no family, nobody in society really cares about you, especially if you are not rich enough to pay someone to care for you and take care of you. The treatment of childless people in old folk homes is often much worse than that of people with families, since they do not have anyone to turn to. Childlessness in Europe and East Asian countries reached its highest ever levels with women born around 1970. In Italy, Spain and Greece, around 20% of women born in 1970 are childless, while in German-speaking Europe it comes close to a quarter and in East Asia a third of the women born around 1970. In Central and Eastern Europe the figures are significantly lower, usually between 10 and 15%, but it is climbing up as the countries are culturally increasingly westernized. And we have not yet seen the consequences. These women have not yet reached retirement age since they are over 50 and still have a decade of productive life ahead of them. Two countries I recommend following in the coming years and decades are Germany and Italy. The two oldest countries in Europe and also the oldest countries in the world behind only Japan. In both countries, their most populous generations born in the 1960s will retire in the next 10 to 15 years, first in Germany and a little later in Italy. Among these populous generations of retirees, there will also be increasing amounts of those belonging to the childless group. With a certain degree of certainty, it can be predicted that Germany will handle this process significantly better than Italy, since it is economically still a powerhouse and its demographic predicament is not as bad as the Italian one. On the other hand, Italy has been in an undeniable economic decline for the last quarter of a century. To conclude this chapter, I thus believe that the fertility will rise again and will rise significantly, but it must get worse before it gets better. Only the visible and omnipresent reality of elderly poverty, daily worry about fundamental necessities and the lack of health care and the perception of the difference between the situation of the elderly who had larger families and those that did not will shift the role of having large family from the expensive luxury of those who want it and can afford it to one of the prerequisites of elemental economic security in the second half of your life.
Such changes in people's reproductive behavior would, of course, not be entirely conscious and will be accompanied by significant ideological shifts. I think there will be two significant ideological cleavages, already emerging but not entirely fleshed out yet. First is the clash between the age groups. That is, of course, nothing new, since the ideological conflict between young and older people is one of the classic political cleavages. But the new age conflict will not be primarily ideological, as it is in the contemporary Western world regarding the perception of opinions of the so-called baby boomers as backward by the younger generations. This new conflict will be economic at its core. The widespread feeling that the inadequate share of the economic output of people in the productive age is heading to pay for the needs of the retired generation, instead of being used to address the problems that the young are dealing with, such as housing, education or, in case of some people, the climate change, will inevitably increase in the coming decades. In the West, the narrative that the boomers that are now retiring lived life on an easy mode and the new generations have to deal with the fallout of their prosperity is very prevalent, notwithstanding if it's true or not. In post-communist Europe, it is much harder to perceive history in this matter, since the older generations grew up under the oppressive totalitarian communist regime. Still, the economic logic of aging populations is merciless. The overall perception of the older generations is also bound to transform. We live within a cultural framework where old age is highly respected, partially based on certain hierarchical cultural predicaments, but also on scarcity. In a demographic structure of societies before the demographic transition, where the median age might be around 25 and the life expectancy is about 40, you better listen to someone who is 70 years old. He has likely seen some shit and has valuable experience. He is wise. But in the world, couple of decades from now, with the median age around 50 and life expectancy over 80, the scarcity is gone. The life experience of the millions of old people, comprising between 30 and 40% of the population, will not be unique. The cultural attitude of young people toward the elderly will, unfortunately, reflect that. The second cleavage will be the ideological schism between the genders. Researchers suggest that since the 1990s, women in Western countries have been increasingly leftist in their views, while men are either getting modestly right-wing or staying where they were before. The schism is especially severe in Austria, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Norway or the Netherlands, but exists in most European countries. Additionally, the split seems to be increasing among the youngest generations of voters. Election results data from Sweden, Poland, Italy, Finland and other countries suggest that young voters in European countries are getting more right-wing, but this turn is mainly driven by young men. On the other hand, young women are more likely to support green parties and the progressive left. It will be very interesting to see this difference play out regarding the demographic crisis. These two processes also play out of each other. Modern feminist narratives and attitudes increasingly alienate young men, but a significant number of young women, supported in this view by the liberal media and cultural establishment, see any traditionalism and family-oriented approach perceiving motherhood as an essential, even if not exclusive, mission of a woman in life, as an attack on what they perceive as hardly one cultural and societal capital. And to a certain extent, they are probably right, since the amount of economic and cultural capital women hold in the contemporary West is likely the highest in any large human civilization ever, even if the feminists still perceive their plight as an unbearable shekel of patriarchal oppression. But the current status quo of sub-replacement fertility is mathematically unsustainable, since it leads to an eventual extinction. If the price that needs to be paid to remedy that situation is to somehow adjust the current position of women in society, it will happen sooner or later. If a vital interest of the whole society stands against a particular interest of one, although significant, of its segments, the overall societal interest has to prevail. That is just common sense. After all, even the next generation of strong, emancipated women needs to be born by someone. They are not being manufactured in a strong, emancipated female factory. But, as I previously discussed in the chapter about the rolling back of women's rights, it must happen organically and with significant restraint. There will likely be an increased radicalization of young men in the coming decades, 
frustrated by the national decline, economic hardship and unsatisfactory position in a contemporary cultural environment. I would not be surprised by significant hardcore right-wing or even a semi-fascist support in many European countries. But to somehow work the demographic problem out, we need the sexes to cooperate. You cannot run a prosperous society in spite of one half of the population. I believe we will figure it out. The countries experiencing the most severe demographic decline might also gain an advantage in the long run. For example, if Southern and Eastern Europe and East Asia won't completely disintegrate under the demographic pressure and the fertility will then rise again significantly due to the socio-cultural shift connected with larger families ensuring better economic situation in the old age, they might be getting into an era of new youth bulges just in time when different countries comparatively much younger today, will be entering their acute phases of aging and decline, which might give the currently problematic countries comparative advantage sometimes at the end of this century and in the beginning of the 22nd century.